Hello, Stephanomics here, the podcast that brings you the global economy. And this week, we're joining world leaders in Japan, virtually at least, as they head to the G7 Heads of Government Summit in Hiroshima. It wasn't so long ago that people spoke wistfully about getting rid of the G7 altogether. I mean, having just the US, Canada, Japan and a bunch of European countries sitting around the table just didn't feel like a representative sample of the global economy. But today, a lot of extra countries get invited. Plus, everything going on in the world has left the G7 needing a safe space. The change in geopolitics and economics is particularly evident in Asia, and perhaps nowhere is it more challenging to policymakers than in Japan. I'm getting into all of that in a few minutes with distinguished thinkers and authors Richard McGregor and Rory Medcalf. But first, Here's our economy and government reporter, Yoshiaki Nohara, in Hiroshima. It's August 6th, 2022. The clock hits 8.15 in the morning. Precisely 77 years ago, this time, the world's first nuclear bomb exploded here in Hiroshima, Japan. I'm standing among hundreds of people observing a moment of silence for the victims. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida steps forward and dedicates a wreath. We must not repeat the calamity on that day 77 years ago. This is our nation's responsibility as the only one hit by an atomic bomb. And it's my pledge as Prime Minister from Hiroshima. This coming weekend, Hiroshima will be hosting the G7 summit and Kishida will reiterate his pledge for peace. But in the background, stakes are higher than ever. Russia is escalating nuclear threats in Ukraine. North Korea keeps firing missiles, and China is putting greater pressure on Taiwan. They're all Japan's neighbors. Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio ordered the defense and finance ministers on December 5th to secure 43 trillion yen for defense spending from fiscal 2023. Ironically, peace is often preserved through the supply of heavy weapons. Kishida has ordered a historic increase in defense spending. Japan's military budget is now set to be 2% of its economic output. That would rank third largest in the world, only after the US and China. Japan had said multiple times this year that it will drastically strengthen defense capabilities. Now, Kishida is counting on private companies to make sophisticated weapons to arm Japan's self-defense forces. And the key weapons factory is located in, of all places, Hiroshima. The Japan Steelworks Hiroshima plant sprawls over a flat plain on the eastern edge of the city. The company let me enter the factory and watch them making artilleries and cannons. But they wouldn't let me use any sound or take any photos. It's a secret operation here, and even locals are dimly aware of what happens inside. So I will just describe what I saw. JSW Factory specializes in making artilleries. I saw a bunch of cannons and guns they would be loaded on warships and tanks. I looked into the barrel of a cannon. I saw spiral grooves inside. That will allow shells to spiral through the air in a stable trajectory and hit targets. During the tour, the smell of machine oil hung in the air. There was a constant buzz from cutting steel. Some beams supporting the ceiling were rusty, which wasn't surprising given the factory was built before World War II. The local managers who gave me the tour said they never let a journalist in before 
They all declined to be quoted. They said their families might be harassed if the nature of their work was publicized. After all, this is Hiroshima, the world's mecca for pacifism. But then I met Kato. Yachio Kato was 15 years old when she began working at the JSW factory in 1944. At her all girls school, students were forced to skip classes and work at factories while their fathers, brothers, and uncles were sent to fight. Kato and her classmates pulled 12 hour shifts making bullets around the clock. We were told all the way from elementary school that we shouldn't spare our lives in order to stop the nation. We thought we must work hard for Japan. That was all we care about. On August 6, 1945, Kato took a day off because the factory was closed for a routine power saving day. Kato and some friends planned to go swimming outside town. She was waiting for a train when the bomb hit. She doesn't remember the blinding flash or deafening sound that other survivors would later recall. She just woke up on the ground, perhaps 10 meters away from where she was standing and found her two friends. One's face turned brown like a sunburn the other's right arm was studded with shards of glass. They staggered toward a shelter where other survivors flooded in. Their skin was peeled off all the way, hanging from their fingernails. The three of us huddled together and cried. It was hellish. Even in hell, I don't think it would be that horrible. The war ended soon afterwards, and Kato never returned to the factory, which stopped making weapons. In 1947, Japan adapted a new constitution that renounced war for good and pledged its armed forces wouldn't be maintained. Then, the Korean and Cold Wars came about, threatening peace in the area. JSW started making weapons again, constitution remains the same even today, but in reality, Japan has built self-defense forces, which is military, and companies have long made weapons for them. Now, it's going to take a lot of work to get Japan's defense industry ready to meet Shida's goals. Many contractors have shuttered defense operations in recent years. They can barely make ends meet with low profit margins in government contracts. They cannot export their products easily either due to tight regulations. Defense Ministry Manager Kyosuke Matsumoto told me he cannot keep track of how many are gone. There is not much profitability or possibility for expansion. That's why new players, investments, or resources aren't coming in. As a result, our technical strength has weakened and our advantage is being threatened. That's the state of the defense industry. Shots were fired at Camp Kaitaichi for self-defense forces. The camp is just next to the JSW factory. Soldiers were training and preparing for the camp's 72nd anniversary. I struck a conversation with Koki Hiraoka, a 21-year-old medic. Hiraoka told me that people may be rallying for peace, but officers still have to be ready for enemy attacks. I'd be lying if I say I'm not scared, but if we quit one after another, nobody will be left to protect Japan. I try to gather my courage. It's my duty to serve. 
On August 6, last year, peace activists rallied along the main street in Hiroshima. They chanted against Kishida's moves, which they considered as weakening the constitution and arming Japan. But polls are showing more people are favoring a boost to defense spending and gaining more military capability. Even Kato, who worked for JSW as a girl, is becoming less idealistic. She is now 94. Every year on August 6th, she cries at the ceremony to commemorate the nearly 700 students and teachers from her school killed by the bomb. The idea of a rearmed Japan breaks her heart, but she also has no illusions about peacekeeping. Japan has renounced war, but if others attack, Japan will have to protect its citizens. For now, the peace bell continues to toll in Hiroshima. In Hiroshima, for Bloomberg News, I'm Yoshiaki Nohara. Well, that was such a thoughtful and evocative piece there from Hiroshima by Yoshi Nahara. And there's there's a lot of strands uh, there that would be worth following up. And I'm going to talk to two experts now who could run away with any one of them. Uh, Richard McGregor is an Australian journalist, writer and author. Uh, he is currently working as a senior fellow at the Lowy Institute based in Sydney, Australia, and has written numerous extremely influential books on China, including The Party, Asia's Reckoning, and more recently, uh, Xi Jinping, The Backlash. We also have Rory Metcalf, who has been head of the National Security College at the Australian National University for a long time. He's also written a lot of influential uh, books, including most recently Indo-Pacific Empire, China, America, and the Contest for the World Pivotal Region. Well, one reason, uh, obviously, we wanted to go to Hiroshima is that Prime Minister Kishida has himself chosen that as the location for this weekend's G7 Leaders Summit. Um, Rory, uh, there's clearly a message there, the sort of symbolism is about the dangers of unrestrained geopolitical conflict. Um, but the military buildup in Hiroshima itself, which Yoshi talks about in that piece, you know, underscores that to achieve peace, Japan now thinks you have to increase preparations for war. So just... Um, Stepping back a little, you know, how much of a change does this represent in Japan's strategy? So, uh, Stephanie, it, it it does seem to point to a dissonance in the way that um, Japan thinks and acts strategically in the world. But in fact, um, this isn't so new. You know, for the past 15 years, almost 20 years now, I think Japan has begun to emerge as a strategic actor in the Indo-Pacific region. Indeed, the very idea of a connected Indo-Pacific region, which kind of enables um, countries like India and Japan to work together, or India and Australia, or the Quad to work together, was driven in significant part by Japan, by Japanese leadership, by, by, by Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister Abe. Um, I think it's really important to bear in mind that this is not the kind of militarization of Japan that the Chinese like to warn us all about. It's still relatively restrained and it's really about Japan trying to adopt a defence posture that most countries, that most powerful countries in the world would recognise as, as being a pretty normal thing to do. But it is a big change for, uh, for Japan and it points to a Japan that's more um, sober uh, and realistic about the, the realities of armed force in the world. So the lesson I draw is how well is Japan going to strike the, the new balance of diplomacy, deterrence, and uh, a, I guess, more um, realistic effort at economic prosperity uh, that reduces the, um, you know, the risks that come with globalisation and connectedness. Well, Richard, 
I guess I should we could go straight on from there. I mean, how realistic is that effort by by Japan? Well, in some respects, you know, most of the attention on the, you know, uh, the Japanese efforts to rebuild its military are focused on money. So in some ways, raising the money is easy. Spending it is difficult for multiple reasons. You know, in post-war Japan, the the, minist- the uh, military, you know, self-defence forces, they're called, by the way, which tells you something, um, as a, uh, the... The military in Japan has been a very low prestige and and low profile uh, institution. Uh, you rarely see um, uh, uh, Japanese military officers on the street in their uniform in Tokyo uh, or elsewhere, and that's been quite deliberate because they didn't want to attract uh, attention to themselves. They, the military inside Japan has really been seen more as a disaster relief. Um, organization rather than an organization which can really fight and win wars. So for all those reasons, um, uh, uh, the the government might have lots of money to spend, but they're going to struggle to recruit people and train people uh, and keep them with a declining population and a still slightly growing economy. Um, There's many more jobs on offer um, there are, then people, there are people to fill them. They're going to really struggle to actually fulfill uh, the task that Mr. Kishida has set for them, that is to build a, a, a much more modern min, uh, military, a much more mobile military, uh, and a military which is much more suited uh, to the perilous strategic circumstances that Japan now finds itself in. Rory, Richard's talked about sort of the very practical <laughs> problems mm-hmm. involved in this. I guess there's, as an economist, I look at a much more uh, basic issue that... Uh, even though the uh, political approach, the geopolitical stance with respect to China may have changed significantly over the last 10 to 20 years, if you, by any measure, the economic connectedness of Japan and China, and indeed probably every country in the world's connectedness to China, has increased. So how is it going to be possible to to keep on, to keep those two things um operating on separate tracks? I think in the in the medium to long term, it's probably not realistic to keep those on separate tracks or, 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 or to do both, unless China changes, you know, unless China becomes a less um, risky or reckless or, 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 or coercive force on the international stage, then something's going to have to give at some point. I'm not the economist in the room, but it's important to distinguish trading relations and relationships and investment relationships, for example. Um, you know, going to the Australian experience with China, for example, uh, of course, uh, even during the era of Chinese economic coercion or the phase of Chinese economic coercion against Australia over the past five years, uh, you know, the trade relationship effectively grew, um, you know, significantly because of the price of, uh, of iron ore and China's dependence on Australian iron ore. But the investment relationship uh, was already going downhill and, and effectively went over went over a cliff and will be hard to rebuild. So um, I think we do need to look below the surface of the numbers. I think it would be interesting to understand in Japan, particularly how the business business community is thinking about investment in China, is thinking about the risks that come with becoming too entangled, even things like the consular safety and welfare of their own staff and, and executives. And I think that's not only a Japan-China story, that's a story for Australia, it's a story for Europe. Uh, Of course, it's a story for um, the United States as well. I think the hardening of Japan's defence posture that we've seen, while that might be, you know, the pointy end of a more robust national security response to uh, a, a dark strategic environment, it's not the only response. And I'd be surprised if there isn't thinking in the Japanese system about you know what does the future of the supply chains look like? What does the future of critical technologies look like? And a lot of that will be, I think, informed by the kind of de-risking approach uh, that we've at least heard uh, Europeans speak about at a um, uh, at a leadership level. Although we may not be seeing it happening across the board among um, corporates yet. Well, actually, Richard, I was going to ask you, I mean, you do hear this language now of de-risking the relationship with China around the world. 
um, rather than decoupling, which sounds marvellous. And I think especially if you're a businessman who doesn't want to really completely un untangle the, the supply chain uh, with China, it sounds it sounds much better. Um, but does it actually mean anything? Is it possible? Well, it's not quite pie in the sky, but it, it's, it's almost impossible for global economies to disentangle themselves from China. The good news, though, is that the same applies to China itself, because China can't disentangle itself either. Now, obviously, China has been trying to do that for many years. They've got their own sort of policies, so-called dual circulation. In other words, that they can uh, de-risk their own economy against the kinds of sanctions that America is pursuing against it right now. But, but I feel the amount of decoupling or de-risking that, that has taken place is pretty superficial compared to uh, the depth of it uh, at the moment. It's the word buzzword on everybody's lips. But if you talk to business people in any detail, then it's it's just about impossible. And that this is, in fact, quite a positive thing, I would say, in many respects. It can be, it's a negative thing to uh, apply or uh, rely on China, of course, but it's positive in as much as it restrains uh, Chinese behaviour because the entire global economy really goes through China, uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, to a lesser extent, Southeast Asia. Any interruption to that has an immediate and dramatic effect on the global economy and on each economy uh, individually. So um, I'm not quite sure how anybody can uh, uh, get out of China. Um, and I hope that ultimately uh, is a stabilising factor in geopolitics because it affects China as well. For many of the people listening who are sitting in the US, they do only see this, uh, or we often will only see it through the, the US lens. So I think highlighting that there are now these other relationships and other um, strategic um, partnerships rising up is is a good one. But Richard, I did notice that 2016 was also the last time that you had a G7 meetings, including the I think there was a foreign minister meeting in um, Hiroshima. Um, since then, you've had the Trump administration, you've had now the Biden administration, part of the Biden administration. Um, how has the US change the game? How has the US's emerging attitude to the region affecting the way countries think about it? Well, it, it, it depends what country you're in. Certainly the US uh, has changed its geopolitical policies towards China, defence policies, and I think that started rather abrupt, abruptly under Trump, but it's, you know, to give him credit, but it's been refined and kept by uh, President Biden. I think President Biden also um, has also changed uh, um, U.S. economic policies. Not it's probably a bit unfair to call it along Trumpian lines, but you know they've maintained the tariffs against China. They're accelerating uh, a form of industry policy um, in the United States through the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, through various incentives to build semiconductor plants in the United States and, of course, the speech, recent speech by Jake Sullivan where he laid it out as part of, you know, a core part, reindustrializing the United States as a core part of US geopolitical strategy. Now, this affects all sorts of countries uh, in different ways. You know, for example, uh, South Korea and Japan, which, you know, want close relations with the US and, in fact, depend on them, have had to adjust their own domestic economic policies and tech policies to fit in with that. A country like Australia, which sees itself as a sort of renewable energy superpower, is now going to struggle to attract the investment it needs to do that because the in Inflation Reduction Act is the giant sucking sound which is taking, um, you know, attracting global capital to the United States instead of uh, uh, to other countries. The US thinks that it fell behind in strategic competition with China and is now rushing to uh, catch up again. Um, and so it's not going to take, you know, it's looking for leverage um, just about it, it, at every point. And that, in some respects, is extremely welcome in parts of uh, the region. But of course, if the US um, pursues policies like that, then it's going to rebound on them uh, as well. And I think particularly uh, in the economic sense in Asia where, you know, China is really, um, I think, starting to streak well ahead at the moment and where the US 
because of its suspicion of trade um, in the administration and in Congress is really struggling to, uh, to catch up. I just have one, uh, one last question. There is one uh, event which is a long way away from, from Hiroshima, um, but seems to have changed attitudes uh, quite significantly at summits like this weekend's G7 summit. And that's, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have, that is an ongoing story. In fact, the long-awaited uh, counter-offensive by Ukraine, we're certainly anticipating it potentially um, in a matter of days. So, so, Rory, how much has Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's response to it affected conversations like the ones the leaders are going to have at Hiroshima? Look, seriously, I think, uh, very seriously, I think that the, um, the impact of Putin's disastrous um, and brutal decision to invade Ukraine here in the Indo-Pacific is, is pretty profound. It has reinforced the, the national security and defensive aspect of Japan's statecraft. It's done the same here in Australia. It's made it difficult, however, for a number of other partners in the region to work together. I think the fear of conflict in this region has risen, I think, has been heightened by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, paradoxically, you could make a case that the day when uh, Xi Jinping will decide to invade Taiwan, uh, to send the PLA across the Taiwan Strait, perhaps that day has been delayed because Chinese forces have seen um, how no battle plan survives first contact and how uh, the Russian military is so um, so poorly and grotesquely performed in Ukraine. But we can't be sure. And so I think there's now an open debate in this region about whether um, conflict is more or less likely as a consequence of Ukraine, uh, whether, in fact, Taiwan needs to be looking much more robustly to its own defences and ultimately how important military deterrence is. Now, we at the start of this conversation, we talked a little bit about uh, de-risking and about the economic and commercial calculations being made constantly as we study geopolitics. And I would say that one consequence of the Ukraine conflict, the Russian invasion here in the Indo-Pacific, is that I encounter many more voices in business communities who are uh, worried about the reality of war as a fact of life in the 21st century, who know now that they need to have, at the very least, contingency plans for a Taiwan conflict, uh, for their investments, for their personnel, for their, for their staff. Those are conversations that weren't happening three or four years ago, even two or three years ago. And ultimately, wherever the G7 lands on this issue, I mean, I'm sure the Japanese would like to use the G7 as a, as a platform to be putting pressure both on China and Russia. No matter where the summitry goes this week, these realities are going to remain in this region. It's not the, in that sense, you know, it's not the globalised or cornucopian world uh, we were looking at uh, when we were talking rosily about the Asian century just a decade or two ago. It's This is so fascinating. We could carry on for many, many more hours, but I know that we all have to get on with our lives and um, we've already taken more time than I had uh, suggested. So Richard McGregor, Rory Maycar, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of Stephanomics. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, you can get a lot more economic insight and news from the Bloomberg Terminal website or app. This episode was produced by Magnus Henriksen, Yang Yang and Summer Sadi. And the sound engineer for the Hiroshima segment was Zion Lee. With special thanks to Yoshi Nohara, Paul Jackson, Yoshito Okubo, Kiko Ujikani, Takashi Nakamichi, Toro Fujioka, Stacey Wrong, Richard McGregor and Rory Metcalf. The executive producer of Stephanomics is Molly Smith and the head of Bloomberg Podcasts is Sage Bowman. 